consider Colonel Toronto, I suppose, Central Lateral Fisher, Central Sulcus, Free Central, Post Central, Superior, Inferior Turtle, Interprime. And let's consider the primal tract, which is the longest and best known of the cortical determinants. What's the definition of the primal tract? What is primal not? It's an upside down pyramid. The gross pyramid in the medulla. All the fibers go through the medulla. As you recall, it's close to your hindbrain, fashion, midline. So here is the pure animal fact. And it is pyramidal because we look at this now in the basal view with the belly of the pons here, midline. Pyramids come down and cross. Like so. Most of the olive up to the side. A lot of the olive comes down something like this. Divide. Continuing. And this is the pyramidal part. The base and the apex. And so it's the fibers that go through this pyramid. And of course they're cross cut in this view here. And how many are there? How many fibers? Round numbers? Just for comparison, how many fibers are there in the optic nerve? I realize that there's 
no sharp cut off in size, but uh, roughly big enough. Half million. So half of these are, that's a pick another one. Okay. Higher or lower? Well, how much lower? 50,000. 50, that's close. 30,000. Three percent. Um, so we only have 97 percent to go. Um, roughly 60% come from area 4 20% in front 20% behind And they run down and end on what kind of cells? Take a typical spinal segment. has a 
simple reason why these nuclei, which so far in my scheme of things have only received afferents from the ascending branches of push pop fibers, do not show transynaptic action from the visual system. The visual system, that genetry, has presented one afferent, the lateral genica, all the layers of the lateral genica from the optic tract. Cut that, and those cells show atrophy, transynaptic atrophy. And so why wouldn't one see that same thing here if the poster columns were the only afferent to these nuclei of poster columns? And the major clue is, that's an incomplete story, that there is a major uh, connection descending from cortex onto these nuclei. So it's not just the small fiber system on the spinal cord, but also the medium fiber system that receives pyramidal tract input. These uh, fibers uh, take off from the pyramid and cross into the through the medial meniscus into the uh, nuclei of the optic side. So any problems on the general pattern of definition of origin of termination of corticospinal or parental tract? You realize, of course, that some purists have attempted to, to redefine those two names said they're not synonymous. Uh, but for all practical purposes, they are synonymous. There are some, or said to be some, ascending fibers in the um, I think there may be. But it's going to vary from one person to another. And if one allows time enough for Wallerian degeneration to occur following a massive stroke upstairs, there are essentially no fibers left in here. The difficulty is that the central nervous system degenerates slowly. Many months, and you have a very broad origin of these fibers. So to get a very complete stroke is difficult. To have the patient with that big stroke live long enough is difficult. To get the autopsy on is difficult. To think of studying it is difficult. Um, and I think that those who have found a few fibers remaining, including myself, have been fooled by the incompleteness of the lesion, by the incompleteness of time about the degenerate. So while I can't rule out there are a few, I think they're really quite insignificant in the human. All right, uh, any other problems? What percentage of uh, cortical spinal fibers are actually cortical spinal? I mean, some people say that a large percentage of what's in the cortical spinal tract is, is from you know, lower down. Yeah. 
That's why I brought up the question, because there are these statements that there are non-cortical fibers in the pyramid, either ascending or descending from other sources. And as far as I can tell, there aren't any. As far as I can tell, the pyramidal tract and the cortical spinal tract are synonymous. Very difficult to rule out others if one takes into account the fact that you need a lot of time and a large lesion. It's difficult because a large lesion is purely cortical. But some of the best studies have been partial studies with some of the cortical lesions. To try and put them all together and compare them with massive lesions, I really think they're not very many. So we've taken them from the cortex down to the spinal cord to get the cortical spinal in place. What happens, though, when you transect this lesion, this system? This is a system that controls movement of the opposite side of the body. So it crosses, of course, and it sits in front of you. And so one has paralysis of movement of the opposite side of the body. Among these movements, of course, are pain from the leg, lower face specifically, not the upper face. And I think I mentioned back in the middle hindbrain story how this involvement of the face posed a challenge to the anatomists and clinicians and pathologists of the early 1800s. Because this was 50 to 100 years before the concept of synapse had occurred. But it was in the 1890s that the concept came in. And so the French refer to the facial nerve as beginning in the cortex and going to the opposite of the face. But where did it cross? Obviously, it doesn't cross in the pyramid. It doesn't go down that far. And the anatomists saw some of these crossing fibers in the floor of the fourth ventricle, some of which were the crossed oligocochlear pathway. And so they postulated that what we now know as the facial nerve from the synapses on out, instead of taking an internal genome and going back out, it crossed. It wasn't until Millard and Gubler described their cases in which there was an interstitial facial and contralateral hemiplegia that the idea of completely interstitial facial nerve took hold. Nowadays, of course, their evidence is not that good because one can say, well, it destroyed either the nucleus or the exiting nerve. But it paved the way for understanding the facial nerve involved. Of course, it doesn't explain why the upper face escapes in the usual stroke. And that, of course, is usually explained by having bilateral suprasegmental descending control of that part of the facial nucleus that supplies the upper face. Now, David, what about the 11th cranial nerve? Well, apparently it is 
the Supreme Court. What does the 11th Crane Owner do in the first place? The cortical bulbar fibers control the ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid and the contralateral trapezius. So if you do that, the ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid, that must contract, that it goes to the opposite side. So the movement is to the other side. That is difficult to do in an ordinary stroke patient. How about the eyes? The same basic problem. The movement is to the opposite side in a stroke involving the corresponding cortical oculomotor, that nuisance, extractive contrapezius mechanism, paralyzes the movement to the other side. Those systems have their own pathways. I don't know exactly where the cortical accessory go. I would guess they're in the pyramid. The cortical facial, though, takes off above the pyramid and runs in the junction between tegmentum and basis frontis, crossing to the opposite facial nucleus. The ocular motor system takes off much higher at the level of midbrain, probably crossing in or near the posterior commissure and descending lateral, but relatively dorsal, in the tegmentum. So we have a few pieces of anatomy to fill in here as these descending equivalents of cortical spinal tract have to be considered. So now let's consider some of the intermediate associations of cortical spinal tract. From cortex, we go into subcortical white matter and then into the internal cavity. If we take this left cerebral hemisphere and look at the left internal capsule in a radiological plane, we realize that we're backwards from what we usually do. So we have an internal capsule that's something like this. With an anterior limb, a posterior limb, and a genu. And so what lies medial to the genu? See, you're following. So what should I put in here? Medial. This line is going to be here. We're looking at this half of the MRI or CT scan. This is the left side. What comes in here? It's axial contrapuntal. Axial contrapuntal. So anterior medial is going to be caudate. So we want to go up here. The caudate head. What lies medial to the genu? Or behind the genu? Well, the genu is parathalamus. Excuse me. Parathalamus. And 
And if the caudate head lies up here, the body comes back and the tail lies where? Down. So, one more arm right there. So we have the striatum, caudate, the caiman. Divided by anterior and posterior limbs of the internal capsule. I still haven't gotten an answer what lies in the human <laughs> genome. Um, anterior capsule. Well, that's close. <laughs> Rose frame. As the third ventricle goes into the lateral ventricle. And so we have in the midline, we have septum and fornix. Septum and fornix. This should be dotted though. Space on the third ventricle on the other side. And of course, up top here we have the corpus callosum. See the gyrus and so on going to the frontal pole. And if we got a corpus callosum up front, we probably have a corpus callosum back. Spleenium. The rest of the corpus closing coming around the top out of the section. And so we ought to have an end to the third ventricle. And a continuation of the lateral ventricle coming back behind the thalamus to the bare area of the thalamus immediately. And Pendulum of the lateral ventricle covering the lamina fixa here. With the caudate developing lateral ventricle. And some uh, choroid plexus and some fornix. And some more pendulum closed in. So we have lateral ventricle here, like the trigone. Body cut again, going out in the temporal lobe. And so fornix making the same spiral. Okay? Any problems? And so if we have face arm leg, or on the medial surface up there, where are they going to be running in the internal capsule? Now you realize, but maybe you don't, you should realize, that the considerable extent is going to vary on how high or low I cut through the internal capsule. Because the face fibers are out lower and laterally coming in, and the leg fibers higher and medially coming in. So there's going to be some kind of a shift one way or the other as these lateral and medial inferior and superior fibers sweep into the internal capsule. And a priori, you could have them spiral either way. The leg was in front of the face. It happens that roughly face, arm, leg, are in that pattern 
with the face approximately in the zenith and arm and leg behind it in the, in the, in the posterior limb. So there is a spiral from inferior medial and to inferior lateral and superior medial as these fibers come in to roughly laminate in the posterior limb. Parallel to those are going to be face, arm, and leg ascending fibers from what nucleus of the thalamus? PVM, PVL. So these arm, leg fibers are coming from medial to lateral of thalamus, going up to face, arm, leg of sensory cortex. So they're, they're shifted front to back. parallel to each other as they spiral towards the thalamocortical cortical or cortical spinal uh, pathways. Any problem visualizing that? The spiral though is 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 going to be changing as I cut it lower or higher. The lower I cut it, the closer these fibers are going to be to the thalamus. The less spread out they're going to be towards the cortex. So the higher I come, the further up and forward, the lower, the further posterior and closer to the thalamus they'll be. But that's a rough pattern of how they get there. Problems on on uh, cortical spinal tract. I'm tempted to take a little detour at this point and get the rest of the internal capsule in place. And come back to the brainstem sections and where these systems are and what they do. Lesions there. But I think at this point, uh, having gotten some major sensory motor tracks in place, it might help to put in some of the others. So any, any problems at this point? Okay, a little detour. One of the other long outputs of cortex relates to stage three of the cerebellum. Cortical ponto, ponto cerebellum. Fibers that are going to end in what part of cerebellum cortex? All three. All three. So you're going to have fibers from pons going into vermis, so stage one, and out of stage one for the three piece. Fibers and pons going into paravermis and out with the intermediate nuclei of stage two. And fibers of stage three, pons to lateral cerebellum, out to lateral stage three, out the dentin. So that the coordination that allows me to talk and move my eyes and head move my feet and draw requires coordination of stages one, two, and three of cerebellum. So 
balance against gravity. But I'm standing still and moving so that my drawings are not too sloppy, too much of an attention treatment. Uh, characteristic of stage two. And um, so my voluntary actions, which we visualize, conceptualize as coming from the motor cortex, involved in travel track, uh, become smoothed out through these uh, this massive cortical part of the cerebral system. Stage three afferents, but stages one, two, and three efferents from cerebral cortex. And so where are they in the scheme of things? Uh, it should be pretty straightforward that the frontal pole is going to give rise to fibers coming in the internal capsule of the frontal pontine. should be obvious that the parietal pontine fibers come in from above, from parietal level, roughly parallel with the uh, descending uh, cortical spinal tract and ascending downward cortical fibers. I think you see this as coming horizontally, vertically, from anterior, vertically, posterior. But we have a little problem. At least most people have a little problem. In visualizing how these end up in the midbrain. Because, and I haven't told you yet, here we have the cortical sperm tract fibers approximately in the middle third of the pedal. And coming out of space, we have to visualize this in the third dimension in a coronal section through the uh, thalamus. Behind, down 
Or so below the thumb is perpendicular. Both thumbs and the form of nucleus, of course. Behind the thumb is the form of nucleus, retroventricular. And so the temporal pontine fibers are not this way. Just as we saw the auditory fibers from the medial geniculate coming out in the temporal lobe, and just as we saw the temporal detour of the lateral geniculate coming out subventricular, so the temporal pontine fibers from the back are the parallel fibers beneath the lymphoma in the subventricular part of the intercapsule. That means where are these going to be when you get to midbrain? As these capsular fibers funnel down into the penile, you, know, you can visualize the whole system very broad here in cortex, narrowing down in the internal capsule, narrowing still further down into the penile. But here's Here's the neck of the thumb. But it's all these are going to be as concentrated as you can make them. And so, Steve, where are the temporal, parietal, occipital, pontine fibers going to be at this level? Well, in the gross cerebra, you have immediately. So, medial to the corpus spinal tract, you're going to have front pontine, lateral right here, temporal pontine. The way I remember, the temporal lobe is out laterally here. Then it's not likely that the temporal lobe is going to project medial. They're coming in from lateral beneath the main mass of the internal capsule fibers, a rather small piece of subventricular thing, coming in laterally. So at least the temporal ones have to come in from the lateral part of the shrimpino. And then you suddenly realize this is just a recapitulation of the cortex. Frontal to the occipital and temporal. But the central region in between. Just so as though you just take frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal and swoosh them into the penile. Know, and so that's all the mystery there is to that. To the front, right? Uh, it's as though you take the frontal, central, central motor, and pick up from beneath and behind the temporal, parietal, fibers. So if you can see that in three dimensions, the question is, what's, you know, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the question? Why is there a problem? They just formed a natural frontal, uh, parietal, occipital, temporal continuity. Frontal, central, and the others. That's a little detour on the internal capsule. If we go back into the middle and late 1800s, 
and consider the problem of the alternating hemiplegias. Meaning the cranial nerve on one side, paralyzed, alternating with hemiplegia on the opposite side. And related to the position of the cortical spinal tract in brain stem. At the level of the midbrain, of course, we have the third nerve nucleus, this fiber is coming out medially, mostly through frontal pharmacy fibers, but near cortical spinal. So the pedunculate lesion would give you this elaborate third nerve palsy. fibers coming out uh, at the junction of Pons and Medulla. Is which nerve? Sixth nerve. And so when it has an itchy lateral sixth nerve palsy and contralateral palsy. Next one down, coming out at the junction of Pyramid and Olive, the 12th nerve. And so these are the three classical, 3, 6, and 12, and you double the numbers. But as you look at the nerves coming out, 3rd, 6, and 12, right next to what it was called back. And so these have eponyms, of course, which are favorites, favorites among the neurologists. Eric, you're about to tell me which names they are. I thought, I said, I thought you were about to smile and say hi. <laughs> Third is Weber. Who is Weber? Where did he work? What language did he write in? Steve, you're looking down again, as though I didn't say this last time. <laughs> Mike, you don't have your old notes with you. No. <laughs> difficult to dredge up. We really ought to have a package then of classical neurological writings. I wish Weber would be one. Because he worked uh, in London, he wrote in English, and he had the most beautiful neurological description of his patients with this syndrome. Um, Anyway, he's, he's one of them. How about the six? I hope I'm right. Mobile? And how about the twelve? Well, this one I, I forgot. Um, this Jackson. Chief resident Raleigh throws his hand, doesn't know either. I have to look it up. I think it's Jackson. Um, but 
But anyway, it was Yulee uh, Jackson and Sigmund Freud who were preeminent in their era of knowing how to diagnose brainstem lesions from the knowledge of cranial nerves and corpus artifacts, which is really just coming into general knowledge at that time. I've got five minutes left, and I've been uh, toyed with the idea of giving you a final exam. And so I'm going to give you a final exam, but you don't have to get it in, in five minutes. You will have the rest of the week to think about it. So I'm going to give you a real case. And this was a uh, some perspectives in the elderly gentleman. He was out fishing. Could have been out at Westport, actually down the hill. And it was a little rough. And he fell on the boat. He wasn't sure why he fell. Whether it was a rough wave that made him trip. Or whether he Anyway, he got up and found he had a weak leg. And he went to see one of my friends, at that time an elderly neurosurgeon, who has since died, who was called Dr. R., uh, who examined him and found that leg, the right leg, was weak. And the reflexes were down. And there was a sensor loss. Right. He put the patient to bed. And uh, it's on the weekend. And uh, an old friend of his, the right, stay in the hospital on the weekend. There was a test on Monday. And he comes back uh, to find his patient is denied of a heart attack. So, right? And so the pathologist invites him down to the autopsy to see what he's found. And he looks over the pathologist's shoulders and says, God, it's a tumor. Now that much that I've told you is possible, and that's the case. A live case, a live neurosurgeon, a senior neurosurgeon, uh, a live autopsy, a live autopsy demonstration. And so my question to you is, if you had a hundred such patients, with minor variations on the story I've given so far. What would they show? Where could the lesion be? Depending on some of the niceties of the physical examination that I didn't give you. You didn't say anything specific about the sensory loss, did you? That's one thing I just literally left out. Huh? Uh, it is knowable. It was written in the chart. But uh, I didn't tell you. That's one of the variables. Right? What's another variable? I lowered my voice when I said it. Uh, we, hmm? so what was that, Steve? Well, you said the reflexes were decreased. Decreased? I didn't mean to lower my voice on that one. The reflexes decreased. Yes. Be an anchor.
But I did sort of mumble at one point. Can anyone catch it? That right leg was weak. I said that as clearly as I could. My sensory loss was in that leg. Ah, that's the other variable. I said he had sensory loss in the leg. Leg. Which leg? A leg. How can you say which leg? What's the matter? What? I think I said leg. I don't think I said A or the. So it's the type of sensory loss and the place of the sensory loss that adds a little zip to the case. So I have now installed the 730 in front of time to quit. Was it this hospital so we could go through all my 10,000 cases? This was a real live hospital that in 1960 when I left Houston, the hospital was called the umpteen. It's just exploded. When I was there, it was something in the order of 300 bed hospital, a major neurosurgical center for all the hospitals in Houston. It was the major private neurosurgical hospital. And Dr. Barr was one of the two major senior neurosurgeons. And the pathologist was an old friend too. The only one in this story that I never knew was the patient. But I have the photographs and I can show it to you sometime. But there's no real rush on this. We've got a few more lectures to finish, of course. And see, I knew I couldn't get the basic anchor done in five minutes. So I made a case to think about it. Tomorrow is Wednesday. We don't have a class. Thursday, we do have a class because we're not due down to St. Peter's until an hour later. So we can leave at 8, 747, give them time. We have one or two cases. So we'll have a class on Thursday and a class on Friday. 